Thank you. Uh, yeah, so my talk will be on the double boundary crossing or non-crossing probability uh, for a relatively general class of compound risk processes. And we'll also look at some applications. Uh, and this is joint work with uh, Tsvetan Ignatov from Sofia University, my colleague Vladimir Kishev from CAS Business School, and our PhD student, Sandra Antan. Um, okay, so an overview of the talk. I'll start by introducing the problem, the double boundary crossing probability problem. And then I'll indicate some applications which we'll keep in mind when we introduce the assumptions behind the model we consider. Uh, then I'll describe uh, that the method to efficiently compute that probability, and I'll explain why we are interested in a numerically efficient method rather than explicit formulae. And finally, we'll look at some numerical illustrations in three different contexts, and this will be uh, the conclusion of the talk. So the problem, the double boundary crossing probability problem is as follows. We have a, a process tau, uh, a compound stochastic process with right continuous non-decreasing trajectories. And we are interested in the probability that this process tau stays between two boundaries within a finite uh, interval or time horizon. And the two boundaries, the lower boundary G and the upper boundary H, uh, we assume these are deterministic boundaries. And as you will see later, we, we have very kind of general assumptions about these. Uh, the, the assumption of those being non-decreasing is not really restrictive because there is a very nice result which says that even um, if you have decreasing parts in G and H, you can consider so to say they're non-decreasing versions uh, because the process tau itself is non-decreasing. Uh, so the interpretation of the process tau and the boundaries depends on the application, of course. Um, the, the examples which we are going to look at are in the context of kolmogorov smirnov test statistic, uh, computing the distribution of that statistic, and the boundaries, they represent, roughly speaking, the critical region. Uh, in the context of uh, ring theory, computing ring probability, which is a special case for double boundary crossing problem, uh, we have the process tau representing the um, cumulative uh, claim amounts up to time t, and uh, the upper bound being the uh, cumulative premium income, and of course the lower bound in this case is just zero. And we also look at an example in uh, inventory management, uh, some optimization problem where uh, tau represents the cumulative stochastic demand up to time t, and then we're interested in an optimal replenishment strategy. Um, and g uh, in this context represents some minimum demand level. Uh, right, so that's the problem. Uh, just a few words about the literature. Uh, I haven't uh, kind of included anything on a single boundary uh, crossing probabilities because this literature is vast, uh, especially if one uh, considers Brownian motion. Uh, if you restrict yourself within the double boundary problem, then here are some recent uh, contributions. And um, I should say that the list is not at all exhaustive. It's just I try to kind of pick up some recent stuff. Um, if we uh, consider the uh, case of continuous time discrete state space processes, I would say the literature is rather limited. Uh, it's mainly focused on homogeneous Poisson process, and the boundaries are constant or linear, parallel. Um, in some cases. And here, though, I, uh, I give some exceptions. Uh, the papers by Khmaladze and Shinji Kashvili and Moskovich and Nadler, uh, because they consider homogeneous Poisson process, uh, but their boundaries are general, possibly discontinuous boundaries. And so we'll 
will sort of um, build up on, on those. Uh, and here there are some explicit results, recent explicit results derived uh, for uh, compound processes with uh, the arrival process being in the class of uh, order statistics processes, but I'll, I'll show you in a minute uh, some of these explicit results as well. So what kind of applications we have in mind? The first one which we considered was the computation of the distribution of the kolmogorov smirnov test statistic. Whether it's two-sided or one-sided, uh, we can do both. Uh, but this one is just to recall what it is. We have a sample, x1 to xn, uh, and the classical uh, framework is uh, continuous random variables, and they have some distribution effects unknown, and we hypothesize that it is uh, this continuous distribution f. And in this classical setting, because we have a continuous distribution fx, f of x, uh, the statistic dn is defined in this way. So basically, the, the empirical distribution function of the sample x1, xn, staying within uh, two boundaries defined by the hypothesized null distribution. Uh, so this is illustrated here on this graph. So we have the empirical CDF and we have the two boundaries. Uh, in this classical setting, though, uh, we can convert that problem of this double boundary crossing probability, because this is what we need in order to get the distribution of the statistic. We can easily convert that calculation into one related to the empirical distribution function of uniform order statistics. And then the double boundary crossing problem becomes a one with parallel straight lines. And that's the CDF of uniform uh, order statistics. However, in a non-classical setting, when we assume or hypothesize a discontinuous distribution, so purely discrete or mixed, then we no longer have this sort of conversion. And we have the test statistic, is the same definition. So what we need to be able to compute is the probability that the hypothesized, um, that, that the empirical CDF is between two boundaries given by the hypothesized distribution. And as you can see, because this particular example is a mixed distribution, so you have continuous parts and you have some masses, discrete parts, so you have discontinuities in the boundaries. Um, and you have flat parts as well as continuous parts. So this is one possible application. Uh, due to a result by Glasser, this sort of calculation can be converted into a problem with respect to the empirical CDF of um, uniform order statistics, which itself could be converted into an equivalent problem with respect to a Poisson process. So this is a Poisson process staying within two boundaries which are piecewise constant. And this is an application in the context of Kolmogorov-Smirnov test. Uh, when you hypothesize on a discontinuous distribution. And uh, we'll look at some numerical illustrations later on. Another possible application is uh, in inventory management. So the problem which we are going to illustrate later on is we consider a single item, single warehouse, periodic review, inventory management system with stochastic cumulative demand process tau. And we have this minimum demand limit uh, below which the operations or the business is not sustainable, so we don't want to cross here. And the upper boundary represents um, a replenishment policy, if you like. So you may choose the timings and the batch sizes when to replenish. Um, so again, double boundary crossing problem with uh, general boundaries, yeah, with discontinuities. 
And uh, so here I've, I've sort of described the problem for a specified. We have a total cost function which involves um, ordering costs and holding costs. And you want to minimize this total cost function subject to your cumulative demand process staying within the two boundaries uh, within a finite period of time. So this probability, you want it to be, say, above 90% or 95 so you have this restriction on the probability. And that's a, an application where you really need a very efficient numerical method to compute that probability because to optimize, to find the optimal solution, you will compute that hundreds or thousands of times. So you need to be quick. Um, and another kind of uh, application, which is a special case of a double boundary crossing problem, is the ruin. Uh, probability application. So in this context, we have a lower boundary, which is zero. The process tau, the compound process tau, represents the cumulative uh, claims up to time, claim amounts up to time t. And then you have the cumulative premium income function, which doesn't need to be a straight line, as in the classical setting, but can be any function with possible lump sum discontinuities at places. Okay, so having these applications in mind, the assumptions uh, for the model we consider are as follows. So the process tau, as I said, it's a compound process, uh, and xk, it's a sum of xk, and these are sizes of certain um, events. Uh, we assume them to be non-negative IID random variables. The assumption of being integer valued is, again, non-restrictive, as we'll see a bit later. Uh, and the, the arrival process Xi, we assume this uh, process to be a point process. It models the consecutive arrival times, T1, T2, etc., of certain events. And the the... Uh, interpretation depends on the context, as we've just mentioned. And the assumption is that xi's are independent from the arrival process xi. So what about the point process xi? What, point, what kind of process is that? So we assume it's a point process with conditional stationary independent increments, which is a rather general class of processes. Within this class, and here is the definition, so let's first look at the definition, and then we'll see what subclasses of well-known processes uh, fall into this uh, class. So we have a probability triplet, and we have a mean value process new on this uh, triplet with trajectories that are non-decreasing and right continuous. We have this uh, information set here, the smallest sigma algebra, with respect to which new is measurable. And Xi is a measurable integer valued point process defined on this triplet with this condition here that conditionally it has independent increments with some and also has infinitely divisible characteristic functions. So this definition follows the one given in Serfoso. But I want to... Uh, uh, list here some subclasses within this general class of PPCSII process, so point process with conditional stationary independent increments. The first subclass is point process with independent increments when the mean value process nu is deterministic. And here, of course, examples are homogeneous or non-homogeneous Poisson, negative binomial. Um, as well, so processes which are typically considered, say, in the Ruin theory literature. Another subclass of this is the W stochastic point Poisson process, so Cox process. Here's a definition. So N is a standard uh, with the intensity one standard Poisson process, and nu is independent of N, a mean value process. And Nice examples here are mixed Poisson process, where nu can be represented as a product of random variable w, uh, 
times a deterministic uh, function lambda. And this order statistics point process, which is another example, a special case of mixed Poisson processes. And within this class, uh, we have, again, homogeneous, non-homogeneous Poisson, linear birth process with immigration, for example. So rather general class of, of processes and, and this final subclass here of the conditional compound Poisson process, of course, is also within the class of point process with conditional stationary independent increments. So the assumption on the arrival process is, is quite general, really. Uh, and the methods which we develop, um, as we'll see on, in the numerical illustrations, work for any of these. Um, here, I just want to mention that um, in order to compute this unconditional uh, probability, non-crossing probability, if we have a mean value function nu, which is non-deterministic, so it's stochastic, then we just need to condition and average uh, these conditional probabilities in order to get an unconditional one. So this is necessary, for example, if we consider Cox process. But if we consider homogeneous Poisson, then there is no uh, averaging like this. We just directly compute the unconditional probability. So our aim is to give a numerically efficient method for evaluating the non-crossing probability under these reasonably general assumptions on the process tau and the boundaries G and H. And the reason we are interested in uh, numerical uh, methods rather than explicit results is well, it's very tricky to uh, derive explicit formulas. Um, you have to be a lot more specific about the arrival process and the tau. But even if, you, if, you, if one manages to derive an explicit result, and this is a recent result of ours, under the assumption of um, order statistics arrival process xi, as you will see, it involves infinite summation of multiple integrals with increasing dimension and some determinants here. So, yes, we can compute numerically, but after a certain kind of... Uh, <laughs> it, it's, not, uh, it's not an easy task. Uh, so, for certain parameter values, you can compute. For certain parameter values, you can't read. So, having a, a numerical method which works for any uh, parameter values would be really nice. Okay, so what's the method? It's an FFT-based method, so fast Fourier transform-based method. Uh, the assumptions, as I said already, xk are, we assume here they're integer valued, but as you will see, it's not a restrictive assumption. We can uh, work with continuous random variables as well and just discretize to apply the method. We assume for the boundaries, we assume these are general functions, uh, but we assume the, the upper boundary is a right continuous function and the lower boundary is left continuous, just to be able to specify the inverse functions because uh, we need to know the integer crossing times for both the lower and the upper boundary. And these are really crucial. We denote them by T0 up to Tn. Um, and the reason we are interested in these integer crossing times of the two boundaries is because of that result, which says that if one wants to compute the non-exit probability within a finite horizon zero z, it only it's sufficient to compute the non-exit on discrete uh, on the discrete time points t1 to tn. So rather than looking at the continuum in this interval, one really has to only needs to look at the integer crossing time points for the lower boundary and the upper boundary. So you take the set, the order set of distinct points, and it's enough to look at these non-crossing events on these points. Okay, so having this in mind, 
uh, we define QSM to be the probability of non-exit within the interval 0s and being at level M at the end of the interval, so at time s. So that's the notation, QSM. And um, it's straightforward to kind of uh, express the non-exit probability as the sum of non-exiting within the interval 0 Tn, so that's the last time point, and finishing at level M where N is between the two, M is between the two boundaries at the final time point. And how do we compute this Q, T, and M? Well, the, one can write the chapman kolmogorov equations, of course, given here. And uh, it's kind of uh, tempting to directly compute the non-crossing, the double boundary non-crossing probability using the chapman kolmogorov equations. And of course, that's doable, it's possible. And this is what we call here the direct convolution approach. But the computational cost is uh, a big O of n cube. And recently, there was a, a method proposed for the case of homogeneous Poisson process by Moskovich and Nadler, where they noticed that this vector here, QTI plus 1, so that's the vector on the left-hand side of the equation. So for different m values, you have a vector here. So this vector is nothing else but a truncated linear convolution of the two vectors, this q vector at the previous time point and this vector of probabilities, let's call them transition probabilities for the process tau. So when you make that observation, that Q at the next time point is a truncated linear convolution of the two vectors, Q and P. Uh, one can apply the fast Fourier transform and the circular convolution theorem to compute that probability at the end of the time horizon, zero Z. And as I said, this was done recently for the case of homogeneous Poisson process. And in our work here, we have generalized that approach to uh, the setting of um, any compound process with tau, with arrival process coming from the class of um, point processes with conditional stationary independent increments. So this observation reduces the computational cost from big O n cubed to big O n squared log n. And that's quite substantial especially for large n, as you will see on the numerical, um, in the numerical illustrations. It makes a huge difference. Uh, now, the method, as, as I've just described, is directly applicable to point processes with independent increments, like homogeneous or non-homogeneous Poisson, negative binomial, etc. If we have a general Cox process, if it is with count, if, if the mean value process has countably many trajectories, then what we need to do is for each trajectory apply the method to compute the probability and then sort of average. Um, but that's an exact, obviously, method, so you get an exact result here. And if you have a Cox, yeah, that's written here. So you just have a trajectory for the mean value process, and for each specific trajectory, you compute the non-exit probability applying the method we propose. So you end up with an exact uh, result without any simulations. There's no simulations here involved. If you have a general Cox process where the mean value process has uncountably many trajectories, then uh, we combine the method, the FFT-based method, with a simulation approach, whether plain Monte Carlo or quasi, for uh, the trajectories of new. And basically, it becomes QMC FFT-based method, where you simulate a large number of trajectories from the mean value process, uh, 
conditionally on each trajectory, you apply the FFT-based method to compute the probability, and then you um, average to, to get the final result. So that's, uh, that's now not an exact method, but when we've used it for different values, uh, we, we managed to show that one can easily achieve, say, six correct digits after the decimal point. Uh, so much higher accuracy, much faster than simply uh, directly doing Monte Carlo simulation. Uh, and if you have, for example, mixed Poisson process, again, you just simulate from uh, the random variable W, so it takes value J, and then for this particular simulation from the mean value process, you apply the method, and then you average. So it's fairly straightforward way to apply the method uh, to obtain the, the double boundary non-crossing probabilities. Okay, so starting with the numerical illustrations now, the first one, as I said, is in the context of Kolmogorov-Smirnov um, uh, tests when you hypothesize on a discontinuous distribution uh, we, we don't focus here on, on a continuous null distribution because there are plenty of methods out there. It is implemented in every statistical software. But, um, and, and our approach, our method is just a very good competitive alternative for the continuous case. But in the discontinuous case, um, as far as we know, there is no really an alternative exact and efficient computational method proposed in the literature. There is one method which we are aware of, uh, which is implemented in an R function, KS test, by Arnold and Emerson, and it only works for purely discrete distributions for sample sizes uh, up to 30. So above 30, they simulate, uh, and we've compared with them um, in our paper so, uh, yeah, so the method which we propose here, as far as we know, is the only uh, way to compute the distribution of the Kolmogorov smirnov test statistic when you hypothesize on a general discontinuous distribution. And the reason one, uh, why one want, would want to be able to compute that is um, because, uh, as far as we know, people are kind of... Uh, misusing the continuous version of KS test when they hypothesize, say, on a purely discrete distribution, when they do goodness of fit with purely discrete distribution. Um, and when you do that, it turns out that you are conservative. So the null hypothesis that the sample comes from a discontinuous distribution will be accepted more often if one uses the continuous KS test as opposed to using properly the discontinuous, its discontinuous version. And this is illustrated on the next slide where we can see that if, you, if one uses the discontinuous case test, you may reject the hypothesis for the same sample using the, misusing the continuous version, one will end up not rejecting the null hypothesis. Um, and also another reason for being interested in that calculation of the distribution of the KS test in the discontinuous setting is because the KS test for discrete distributions could have a greater power than, for example, the chi-square test, which is typically used with discontinuous distributions. Um, right, so this is just an example on using the FFT-based method, which we developed uh, in that context and it's implemented in an R package called KS General. It's available uh, together with the paper. And as I said, it does compute very efficiently, so that's a fast and accurate way to compute exact p-values. So when we say exact p-values, uh, on that excessive loss reinsurance example, where you have uh, a retention level and a limiting level, uh, and then the insurer pays Z and the reinsurer pays Y, so they split uh, the claims. And here, the distribution of Y naturally is a mixed distribution. Uh, so on that example, we illustrate that the method can compute uh, 
exact p-values as small as 10 to the power minus to the power minus 10, or as big as almost one. Um, also for sample sizes from 25 to 250,000. So really kind of generally applicable method. Uh, you're not restricted by the sample size or by the value of the test statistic. And here in brackets uh, is the time in seconds. So of course, for the 250,000, it takes almost an hour, but for, uh, for 2,500, it's a fifth of a second to compute. Right, so this was the application of this FFT-based method in the context of KS. Uh, now, another application is in the ring theory context for computing ring or survival probabilities within a finite time horizon. So that's a special case of double boundary crossing probability. Just to recall, uh, H of T in this context, as I said, models the cumulative premiums up to time T. Uh, tau, the process tau, uh, this compound process models the claims, the aggregate claims up to time t. Uh, and we have the surplus process, the difference between the two, and we define the instant of ruin when the surplus goes negative. Um, and that's the formulation of the problem in terms of survival probability. So you have the process tau staying below the upper boundary H. I just want to highlight the fact that we assume touching the boundary to be a non-exit event. So whenever, when we introduced the problem earlier on, I forgot to mention that the touching the boundaries in our setting, we assume it to be a non-exit event. And of course this can be um, dropped out if you're interested in the strict inequalities. We can compute these as well. But what's implemented, say, in this package or the way we implemented the software is with the equality. Okay, so for ruin probabilities, uh, first we of course considered some classical setting of homogeneous Poisson with discrete uh, homogeneous Poisson arrival process with uh, discrete claim amounts because we have exact results and we have alternative methods and we can compare. So that's the FFT-based method which we developed and that, uh, that's uh, a convolution approach by Lefebvre and Loisel. Uh, and of course the timing here is an issue, not so much the, the accuracy because uh, they also can get very accurate results, but the timing, for example, for large um, time horizons or for large initial capital here, we compute in 19 seconds, whereas the convolution approach takes about half an hour. So that's just for uh, the purpose of comparison. Uh, and also, as I mentioned, if we uh, consider continuous uh, random variables for the sizes x, uh, then we can discretize using, for example, the method of local moment matching, and I have to cite Painter here, sorry, that's a mistake. Um, so if you discretize and match the first moment uh, on this particular example for an exponential distribution, then uh, decreasing the, the step for discretizing, we, we get a very nice, uh, here we get better and better accuracy. Uh, so very nice convergence, say six decimal points after, uh, six digits after the decimal point. Right, and the last example in the context of ruin is uh, when we assume a Cox process with uh, unit jumps. Uh, that's a model considered in the paper by Albrecht and Asmussen, uh, where uh, 
the only way uh, for them to get um, to compute the probabilities or numbers was with uh, Monte Carlo, uh, whereas we um, can use our FFT-based method combined with QMC for the simulation of the mean value process in order to compute the final probability. So basically, this example is uh, when the arrival process is a Cox process with a Poisson short noise intensity. Uh, and here is the specific um, uh, the, the, uh, they specify the mean value process in this way. So for specific values of the parameters, which we give here, we computed some survival probabilities and the upper boundary is a quadratic deterministic function, so it's not a linear function. Uh, and one can see that with this QMC FFT based method, which we propose, we can get much more accurate results much faster than, say, directly using Monte Carlo simulations. Right. Um, and one more application. Ah, here, just the convergence of that. Um, of, of using the method in the context of this uh, example where we get, again, six accurate digits after the decimal point. Um, so when you increase the simulations, the number of simulations for the mean value process, uh, we get a nice convergence. So the final example where the double boundary crossing probability sort of is needed or occurs as a problem, as I mentioned earlier, is this inventory management problem uh, where we have the stochastic demand process tau, we have the minimum demand level g, and we have this uh, h of t function, which we assume to be piecewise constant, and it represents uh, the, 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 the replenishment policy. So basically, you have uh, time points within the interval 0z uh, where you order new batches of different sizes uh, and they get shipped to the warehouse to meet the demand process. So in other words, you don't want your uh, stochastic demand process to um, hit this H of T function because then you will incur um, stock out costs. Yeah, so you will incur losses if that's happened because you won't be able to meet your demand. Uh, so in this context, uh, we have a problem, uh, on a, an optimization problem, which says that for a specified total cost function, which I specify on the next slide, it involves ordering costs uh, that depend on the total amount that needs to be ordered within the fixed time interval uh, and also depends on the number of shipments, R. So that's the ordering costs. And we have also holding costs uh, part of, so these are CH and CO, these are part of the total cost function. And this total cost function, which we want to minimize uh, subject to the probability that the stochastic demand process stays within the two boundaries within the finite time horizon 0z, this probability we want it to be reasonably high. Yeah. So again, this is a minimum demand level and that's uh, the optimal replenishment policy which will minimize the total costs subject to that constraint. So in this context, as I mentioned earlier, one needs to compute that probability hundreds or thousands of times in order to find the optimal cumulative replenishment function HD. Because we need to be able to specify the timings of shipments or replenishment, so the timings, as well as the sizes of the batches.
Okay, so I've explained more or less what's the context. And the example we consider is a Poisson lock example. So the arrival uh, process is a Poisson process and the amounts are uh, discrete, logarithmically distributed random variables. Uh, and that's an example considered recently in the operations research literature. So it's practically relevant. As I mentioned earlier, this is in the context of a single item, single warehouse periodic review inventory management system. Uh, so for this particular example, we specified uh, values for the parameters. And uh, for those specific values, it turns out that the optimal replenishment policy will be instead of ordering everything at the very beginning at time zero, so say you need 35 units of whatever, uh, then it's better to have two shipments, 22, size 22 at time zero and size 13 at say half the horizon because here the horizon is zero one. If we change the values of the parameters, we have also computed different cases. It may turn out that it's better to have, for example, five shipments at different times of these sizes. Yeah, so really it's a multidimensional, highly multidimensional problem which one needs to solve. And uh, with, with our method, which takes for kind of an ordinary um, double boundary crossing probability calculation takes milliseconds, uh, it may take a few hours to solve one of these. Uh, but what's interesting here is to notice, to know that, okay, that's a 3D plot looked from the top. Uh, so it's like a heat map and it uh, gives the total cost function. So here, the red zone, it means uh, higher total costs, uh, and here the blue ones are lower uh, values for the total costs. And if the square represents uh, the total cost for the domain where uh, different possibilities uh, we can have different possibilities for the timings and the batch sizes, then this restriction here uh, is given by the, by the constraint of having a probability greater than one minus epsilon. Yeah, so these are the feasible um, choices, so to say where we have that probability greater than whatever we want it to be. And here the empty area represents shipment time, timings with batch sizes, which are giving you a probability lower than that one minus epsilon. So among those here, uh, the optimal solution is somewhere here. So it lies on the edge of the domain uh, which is restricted by this condition, by the constraint of the probability. So that's the last example which we wanted to present, uh, illustrating the need for computing double boundary non-crossing probabilities. Uh, and just to sum up, we developed and we proposed a numerically efficient method for computing this finite horizon double boundary non-crossing probability. Uh, under reasonably general assumptions for the process tau, for this compound process tau, and relatively reasonably, uh, relatively general assumptions on the boundaries, allowing so they can be nonlinear with jump discontinuities as well. So there, uh, we believe there is a broad range of applications for this kind of problem. We illustrated just a few here, and I'm sure Everyone in this room can think of other applications and we welcome any kind of suggestions or comments on where this could be used. Uh, so finally, some literature. Uh, 
for references. I've highlighted here uh, the paper which uh, is on the Kolmogorov Smirnov test statistic with the R package behind. And there is another paper on, on this more general setting uh, which I presented today. So thank you. In, the, in your optimization problem, do you optimize from time zero on and, and then where, how, or do you use a dynamic programming or something like this? Uh, so, maybe on the graph. Uh, so you're asking how do we find the solution? Yeah. Uh -huh. So we first we fix the total amount which needs to be ordered within the finite time horizon 0z. So say in this example it's 35 units. Yeah. This can be done yeah, using because you in order to look at this problem, in order to solve that problem, you need to have an estimate for the stochastic demand process. Yeah, so you expect some demand within this time horizon. So you fix the total amount, which needs to be ordered within this time horizon. So shipments are decided at time zero. You cannot adapt to the... Uh, uh, yeah, shipments are... So this optimal policy is decided at time zero. Everything, okay. Yeah. Uh, so once you fix the total amount, then uh, the first thing we do is we say, okay, we fix uh, the shipments to two. And then we solve the problem if you only have a shipment, well, something at time zero and another shipment at time t2. Uh, and then you find the optimal or the minimum total cost. Then you solve the same problem for three shipments and you find the minimum total cost. Then you solve the problem for four shipments, and again, minimum total cost, and then among those total costs, okay, here, so that's the minimum total cost when you have everything at time zero. That's the minimum total cost when you have two shipments, and this is for three, four, five, and you can see that the minimum among those minimums is when you have two shipments. But that's, that's for the specified parameter values. If you change the parameter values, then you may have different solution. Other questions? But would it be true that there is an optimum level of sequence and then I say it's two? And then after three, four will be worse than three, and five will be worse than four, and the function is somehow has one turning point with respect to the number of sequences. Or is it a coincidence? Uh, by worse, you mean that they have decreasing I, yeah, that's right. values? Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't call this worse. I mean, somehow it happens that, okay, because you want to, you have this restriction about the probability. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the probability of the <laughs> demand process being within the boundaries. It turns out that if you have a very small amount at time zero, then this probability is low. Yeah, yeah. So somehow we, we didn't kind of, we were puzzled at the beginning when we uh, obtained these results, but then it became natural. I mean, you really need a bigger amount at time zero in order to make sure the probability is higher. And then it turns out that the next ones somehow are smaller and smaller. Maybe because that's um, the way we specify the total cost functions. So we have a fixed cost K, which doesn't depend on the number of shipments. And then we have another cost per unit. Uh, which depends on W, the total amount, and that's for the ordering cost. And the holding costs are, again, per unit, and then you have this at time zero, this at time T2, this the next one at time T3, and so on. I mean, if one changes the, the specifications of the costs, these two functions, the ordering cost and the holding cost, maybe the solution 
would not be with decreasing batch sizes. The optimal solution would not be with decreasing batch sizes, but for this specification, it turns out to be like that. Another question. Oh, sorry. And the more general question is a renewal process or a marked renewal process, you know, additive terms with the renewal occurrence part of this framework that you're working or not? Uh, I didn't catch it from the beginning, you see. Yeah, so the assumptions, as I. Okay, a bit more. Because there is no mark of assumptions, you can have a COPS process. <laughs> yeah, formally the definition. No, it's. Where is the definition point? No, it's. Okay. Further. So it's the beginning. So the definition of a point process, initially when we started this work, we started with uh, point processes with independent increments. Yeah. So basically, uh, homogeneous or non-homogeneous goes on, negative or normal. Uh, but then we realized that we can actually do more. Uh, and that's why this is how we came uh, to the point process with conditional stationary independent increments because then you can include within this class, and this is really the definition we, we got from Sir Fosso, within this class you have, that's the definition, as I said, conditional independent increments with some uh, other requirements, but within this class are the PPII, the Cox process, and as part of this subclass B, the W stochastic uh, Poisson process, we have the mixed Poisson, the order statistics, some examples here, and we have also conditional compound Poisson. So yeah. these are yeah. the process which we sort of tried um, and tested. Yeah, Anything else? So let's thank our speaker. Yeah. Thank you.